Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today, we're going to hear about Trouble and Strife, Issue 1, discussed by Sheila Jeffries and Elizabeth Miller. So over to you two. Thanks, Joe. Hello, everybody. Um, today, Elizabeth and I are going to look at the contents of the first issue of the radical feminist magazine, Trouble and Strife. And what's interesting about it is that, as I will make clear as we go along, I was at and involved in the things that are talked about in this issue. Uh, and Elizabeth, who is younger than me and in the States, wasn't involved in that. So she's looking from outside at these pieces in the journal. And I think that'll be quite interesting to have those two uh, different points of view. So uh, this is a specifically radical feminist journal. And this first issue was published exactly 40 years ago this winter. So I think it's a good moment to look at it. And the magazine was published from 1983 through till 2002, and it's online, so it's a marvelous resource. It's easy to go back and, and look at what the issues were for feminists at the time and compare with the present, which we'll do today. The editorial to the first edition is a very useful definition of what radical feminism is, in case anyone would like to see one from 40 years ago, which is just the same, I think you will agree, as it is now. Now, one signal difference between the feminism of that time, the 1980s and now, is that women were prepared to write, argue and discuss and had print outlets to do that in. The social media of today offers something very different. It allows immediate reactions. It allows organizing and activism, but it does not allow long form articles that develop ideas and everything that's on social media disappears from view very quickly. Also, at the time in the 1980s, writing and ideas were in no way confined to a small grouping of intellectuals, academics, journalists, and so on. A very broad sweep of feminists was involved in writing in the newspapers, bare rib, in the very numerous local and national newsletters, in pamphlets, in trouble and strike, and writing papers for conferences. So many, many, many hundreds of women were involved. Theory making took place in a very egalitarian way. I'm not sure that today it takes place at all. I do think we need something like Trouble and Strife today, even if it's only online, but it could have an archive so women can follow the development of ideas, which is so important. I should point out that the term Trouble and Strife is a Cockney, i.e. East End of London, rhyming slang for wife, in case anyone was wondering where the title came from. It's a misogynist term for wife. Elizabeth and I have divided six of the articles between us to introduce and talk about. And the first of the articles that I will talk about is on the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp. Uh, could we have the first slide, Joe? Thank you. Um, now, the Green and Common uh, Women's Peace Camp started in 1981 outside a US Air Force base near Newbury in Berkshire in protest against the uh, housing of uh, nuclear missiles there. Now, I didn't know um, the history of the peace camp, but Ruth's article explains it. And I should mention that Ruth was the star of a Guardian Women's Page article back in 1978, which covered the way in which a group of revolutionary feminists, including me and Ruth, disrupted the annual Women's Liberation Conference. And there's a photo of Ruth at the microphone on the front, oh, on the Guardian women's page with very clear scissor earrings. At the time, one of the chants we used on marches was two, four, six, eight, who shall we castrate? Which would probably not be seen as acceptable now, but it was then. Now, Ruth explains that the women's group, the women's camp emerged from a mixed campaign against nuclear weapons. The women separated off and set up the Greenham camp. In fact, at the time, in mixed camps, there was the problem that the men, male peace campaigners would go into women's tents and rape them. So there was a difficulty. Now, the politics gradually changed and became more feminist as thousands of women joined the camp and, and joined protests around the base. Many of them were lesbians and women who became lesbian in the heat of battle. Doing activism with women, particularly living with women for months or years to do so, created a passion for women for very many. 
There was, however, considerable disagreement among feminists about whether peace activism was a useful tactic. And there was a conference to express the disquiet about it in 1982. So if we look at the quote, many radical feminists, this is Ruth speaking, have serious disagreements with the women's peace camp. However, as the one day anti-Greenham conference in London last May showed, I was at that conference. It says Greenham has been criticized for taking energy away from the women's liberation movement and for rel relying on the feminine stereotypes, particularly of the natural mother who cares for everything and is emotional rather than political, which feminists have struggled against. The papers at that conference suggested that feminists are being conned yet again by the idea of a greater cause, uh, which makes um, uh, feminism very much a secondary issue, if an issue at all. Can you take that one down, Joe? Thank you. Um, thank you. So it, I don't think people really know now that it was very contentious. There are books about Green and Women's Peace Camp. It's very much lauded as a hugely important part of feminism at the time. However, um, as many of us, radical and revolutionary feminists pointed out, peace is not a specifically feminist issue, since both women and men are affected by nuclear war. I can remember at the time being shocked that some lesbians who had been involved in the group Women Against Violence Against Women, or WAVO, in London, found, which was founded in 1980 and very successful, having about 40 women at weekly meetings to make placards, plan actions, and so on. Some of those women, some of those lesbians involved in WAVO, disappeared to join the peace camp. It was very attractive. It was a women-only space which offered sisterhood and a social and political life for lesbians. But the rest of us at Wavell said they should be more concerned with violence against women rather than men's violence against everyone indiscriminately. Some at Greenham did see nuclear weapons as about male violence and tried to make the issue part of a general campaign against male violence. But radical feminists like me said that feminists should be concerned about the male violence against women, the battery rape, father rape that was happening in their street or next door to them. But the media wasn't interested in that. And so it was not a big affair and it was, you know, it was a different kind of hard slog working on men's violence against women individually. Uh, we made comparisons at the time with what happened when the First World War started in 1914. That split the feminist community and wider feminist struggles couldn't continue when that war began. And some feminists such as Christabel Panker supported the war and others campaigned against it. But feminism was severely damaged by the uh, the war and peace. I don't think it's well known that Greenham had this opposition. The conference that took place to criticize Greenham, I think has disappeared from the record, but the papers from it, one of which was written by a group that I was in, exist in the form of a thin publication from the women's press. Um, and the publication was called Breaching the Peace. It's a pamphlet very interesting pamphlet with our objections to Greenham. Now, Greenham seems now to be seen in feminist history as a highlight of the women's liberation movement. Can I have the next slide, Joe? Um, yeah, so uh, Ruth pointed out that despite Greenham becoming more and more feminist and having some feminist messages, it retained an idea of womanhood, which was dedicated to peace, motherhood, looking after children, and so on, which was not cons consistent with our feminist message. Um, and she, as Ruth says, some women really do seem to believe that what happens to their babies matters more than anything that could happen to themselves, or indeed all adult women. Um, and on the posters, apparently, there was women with long blonde hair and swollen bellies, and so on. Um, so not um, really consistent with our message whatsoever. Within a few years, the, um, the US Air Force stopped using the base and cruise missiles were gone by 1992. And I don't know if that had anything to do with the women's protests. I don't know enough about it. Uh, yeah, can you take that one down, Joe? So I don't know whether, Elizabeth, you have any comments on this piece or want to just move on. What do you think? <laughs> 
Well, I, I want to keep my comments very short because we have taken on the task of talking about six different pieces, which is a lot for an hour. But I just wanted to say, I think that um, when you were speaking, I was thinking about how this is a struggle that happens between feminism and many other um, causes. And it reminded me of um, when you try to talk to Marxists, <laughs> how they tell women that, you know, if, if only the class struggle is won, all of women's problems will go away. And it just sort of reminded me about how when women are in any kind of progressive movements, they're constantly being told to put um, specific, women's specific concerns below whatever the other cause is and that the other cause is what's really the cause and that if that's just solved, that'll solve all of women's problems. And so um, I, I definitely understand why there was this um, ambivalence and struggle with regard to the nuclear movement versus feminism. And, and, and I think you bring up a very good point of, well, is you know nuclear annihilation <laughs> specifically a feminist issue? Um, or is it just another instance of men, you know, male violence against everyone? So I thought that was a really interesting point. Mm. Uh, so I guess it's my turn. Um, I The first piece I'm going to be talking about is called the, sorry, I have many things open here and I just need to move something out of the way. The next piece I'm going to talk about is called The Colonel's Lady and Judy O'Grady, Sisters Under the Skin, question mark. And then the... Um, little description under that is Marlene Packwood argues that the women's liberation movement must listen to the voices of working class women and change its ways. And this was a very interesting piece um, for me as an American because um, it brings up the class issue, which is I think economic class and social class, I think is much more of an issue in Britain than it is in the United States. So um, for me, I had a little bit of an outsider's view on this. Uh, I was thinking about it, and I think that in the US, um, the conflict arises more uh, in the feminist movement in terms of race. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion over the decades of women of color feeling excluded, you know, feeling that the feminist movement is a white middle class movement and that they're excluded from it um, more on um, grounds of race, but, or that they feel that it's not really for them, it's not really about them, it doesn't really center them. Uh, but I think race and class can kind of be proxies for each other across the pond in some ways. Um, so that was very interesting to me um, in reading this. And let me see, let me get back to the article. Um, Joe, if you could bring up the slide uh, about the Colonel's Lady. I'm not sure if you have that up. Sorry, I have, I'm trying to manage a lot of screens here. So if you could bring up the slide about the Colonel's Lady. I wanted to read a couple of quotes from it that I thought kind of summed up um, the main points that the author was trying to make. Um, so the first quote is, middle-class education has always had intrinsic within it a sense of callousness and the selfish hoarding of information which is at the roots of what undermines the confidence of working class women. This attitude is often unrecognized and unacknowledged in feminist meetings and is a primary bone of contention, for it means that some women are in the know and others not. And the second quote is kind of about the solution that she proposes to this problem. So that quote says, While, whilst fighting to keep working class men off our backs, working class women are holding out a hand to their middle class sisters for support, survival, and a piece of the pie. Um, and then I have a little comment here saying, in terms of a piece of the pie, what she means by that, the article mentions income redistribution and help um, from middle class women to um, working class women with help entering the professions um, and help getting into professions that aren't just service professions. If the situation of middle class women as the buffer between working class women's and men's anger at privilege and status is to be resolved, a union of middle and working class women along the lines of advantages, both material and social educational, will have to be set up. So I thought um, 
these kind of these quotes kind of summed up the concerns of the author um, of this article. And it, it was just very interesting to me as an American to read um, about how much of a conflict there was between um, middle class women and working class women and the feelings of working class women in England that um, they had, she, she actually goes on at quite some length about how um, inferior working class women's education has been. Um, and so, um, in fact, she says, one thing she says that kind of surprised me was that um, they feel, working class women often feel that they don't even have the same kind of facility with the English language that that middle women have due to their education. And they also haven't had the opportunity to read um, sort of the background works and read other feminist works. And so therefore, um, that's where she mentions, it means that some women are in the know and others not. Um, and, and she also mentions this um, feeling of inferiority and in their ability to use language in a complex way um, due to their inferior education and that that makes them also feel very excluded um, and that, um, you know, accounts for a lot of the ways in which middle class and working class women couldn't really, in, in the feminist movement, had trouble talking to each other, getting along with each other, um, they had, they appeared to have sort of stereotypes about each other that also interfered with them being able to work together. Um, and so it was really interesting to was seen such a big problem that there would be an article about it in the very first issue of this feminist journal. Um, so I don't know whether that's any different today or whether this is, uh, I had this question about a lot of the, the um, articles in this issue is, are some of these things specific to the time in which they were written or um, are they, is everything in here a continuing issue? Um, to finish up, one thing that she said at the end that I thought was very interesting was that she feels that we're, um, middle class women have kind of a, um, a duty to help sort of give a hand to the working class women and help pull them up um out of their their beginnings that that disadvantage them and she also talks about income redistribution as part of this so i found that very interesting as well um so sheila do you have thoughts on yes i i have to say that the class was huge and it was an incredibly divisive issue in the women's liberation movement in britain at that time and it's interesting if it wasn't quite like that in america and of course it's not exactly the same thing now but there have been huge changes in what constitutes the working class in education and so on uh, but it was very very divisive and seen by quite a lot of women as a kind of horizontal hostility because middle-class women were desperately struggling to get into the professions and so on themselves. Hardly any women were at university generally middle-class or anything else at that time. So for working-class women to say middle-class women should be helping them to get into what they were not into as yet was, I think, a little bit problematic was the blaming of middle-class women for the class structure of Britain itself. And that's not really mentioned in this article, the very serious problems of the class structure, which is still going on. So yes, it was very divisive at that time. And one of the things Marlene is talking about when she says that women can't express themselves very well is that there were some women who called themselves working class who would be very, very angry and swear and be very aggressive in their language. She does mention that in the piece. And of course, for those of us who grew up with working class parents who would never have sworn and who would never have allowed me to say the word F-U-C-K and so on, and that was true of many, many millions of us, um, that seemed unreasonable to say that working class women would inevitably found themselves, find it hard to express themselves and use language that my mother would have sort of fallen in a faint at. So that was, that was interesting and wasn't something we agreed with. So it's a very contentious article, but yes, interesting to you because different situation in America. Yes, so I think you have the next piece, don't you? Or or is the Red Stockings one the next Red one? Red Stockings is next. Oh, Red Stockings. Okay, I get to do two in a row. Okay, so the next article um, is about uh, 
the, the group Red Stockings, which was a radical feminist group from the US, founded, I believe, in 1969. And um, it was founded by women, including, um, uh, oh gosh, I've forgotten her name. Um, sorry. Hold on. Sorry, I'm just to get to that article needing to scroll down till I get to the article. Okay. Um, so it's called Holding On to What We've Won. And the article actually purports to be a review of a book published by um, Red Stockings called Feminist Revolution. And the first thing um, that the reviewer, Sarah Scott, points out is that um, it says it's appropriate. Well, so, so she starts out saying that this is the beginning of a series in which um, Trouble and Strife will look again at influential feminist writings in the light of current women's liberation politics. We shall include both those which we think should be better known and those which may not have been examined critically enough or from a radical feminist perspective when they were first published. Um, and it's appropriate to begin with feminist revolution since the book itself is no longer on sale having fallen victim to the silencing processes clearly described by red stockings themselves. So this was very interesting to me that that was already uh, this sort of silencing and disappearing of feminist writings um, and, and what one of the red stockings, Kathy Sarachild calls the historic invisibility treatment, that that was already something um, happening in the seventies. Uh, that was very depressing to hear about. Um, and so the book wasn't even apparently um, obtainable anymore at the time that this this review of it was written. Um, but so Red Stockings was um, a feminist, a radical feminist organization started in New York in the 60s. And um, they wrote this book, Feminist Revolution, which I haven't seen, um, about that sort of gathered a lot of their thoughts about radical feminism. Um, one thing that was interesting about this article is that it says that it's a review, but I wouldn't really consider it a review of the book uh, because it doesn't actually talk about, it talks to some extent about what's in the book, but it doesn't give an overview of what's in the book. So you, you can't really get a great idea of everything that was in the book from reading this article. And another thing that was interesting about it was that um, I felt that the article kind of started um, in the middle, in the sense that it assumed, it, it sort of commented on um, controversies in the in the radical feminist movement and also between various different um, feminist movements, as if the reader already knew about those things. Um, and so that's something that um, I think is kind of a product of this being written um, in the 80s, maybe the women who were reading the journal would have known about all of the controversies and, and conflicts between different types of feminism um, and, and would have been able to like clearly understand the critiques that the writer about this book <laughs> were making. But um, that was something or I just felt a little bit like as time goes by, it becomes harder to look back at earlier things and understand um, the theoretical conflicts they were having unless the person um, describing it sort of describes those things first. So that was, um, I thought, an interesting kind of historical artifact. Um, and Joe, if you could bring up the slide about uh, radical feminism versus cultural feminism. So, there were a couple of things um, that this person who wrote the, the review commented on um, in terms of conflicts between various aspects of the feminist movements. One was um, therapy replacing consciousness raising. And she um, praises uh, Red Stockings for writing in the book about um, how consciousness, consciousness raising was not therapy. Um, it was very different. Consciousness raising was a feminist project, whereas therapy was sort of a women blaming project and a project that told women that their problems were all in their own heads and that they should look inside themselves to sort of figure out what was wrong with them and heal themselves. 
and that consciousness raising was almost the opposite of that um, in that it was, first of all, it was a collective um, process rather than an individual process between a woman and a therapist. And also the point was um, to listen to what individual women said as a way of accessing um, and analyzing the situation of women as a whole. So that was something that the author of this article thought, um, you know, really praised red stockings for pointing out. Um, she also, the author here also talks about the conflict between cultural feminism and radical feminism. Um, and apparently this was something very, um, very big at the time, this conflict between these two things. Um, and red stockings apparently were the ones who introduced the term cultural feminism in 1975 um, as a way of criticizing um, things that they saw as deviating from radical feminism. And they said that they use this term cultural feminism to describe the depoliticization of radical feminism. And they describe cultural feminism as the belief that women will be freed via an alternate women's culture. Uh, meaning things like um, women only spaces. Um, think it, what some one thing that came to mind for me was Mishfest and um, other women only festivals and lesbian culture in the U.S., which was um, very very big in the '70s and '80s and '90s and the early 2000s even. Um, and apparently, some radical feminist groups such as Red Stockings really looked down on things like that because they felt that they were just distracting from the real problem of dismantling the patriarchy. Although I didn't really see much in her description of what Red, Red Stockings said that um, provided what the alternative would be. So they, I'm not, I would like to know more about what their ideas were about how you would dismantle the patriarchy aside from creating women's culture and women's separatism uh, and spaces where women could focus on each other. Uh, but Red Stockings critical idea of cultural feminism. Um, and I found an article that um, commented on this and said that um, the contrast was that radical feminism was a political movement dedicated to eliminating the sex class system whereas cultural feminism was a countercultural movement aimed at reversing the cultural valuation of the male and devaluation of the female. Um, so at any rate, it's a very interesting um, sort of conflict to read about um, among different strands of feminism. So I will uh, turn it over to you for your thoughts on this. Sheila. Yes, thank you. I do remember at the time that we, some of us were really furious with the attack on this thing called cultural feminism. We didn't know what it was. We thought it might be goddess religion or something. Maybe it was something American. We certainly didn't have it in Britain. If it was an attack on women's spaces, scissor earrings, writing our own poetry and so on, then of course we totally approved of all of that. And we did that as part of you know, the support for our radical feminist, revolutionary feminist activism. It also could be seen as a bit of an attack on lesbians because it was lesbians who were creating this totally different culture that we could live in and draw strength from. So yes, there was a problem with the attack on cultural feminism. I remember being very cross about it. Anyway, um, we'll move on now. Um, it was, Red Stockings was not my kind of feminism. I didn't really like it. I, I know that at the time. Okay, so I, I'm going on to look at a piece by Jane Edgerton, which is called A Personal Account of the Sex and Sexual Practice Conference. And this piece contains, uh, um, consists of Jane Edgerton's reactions to this conference on sex and sexual practice that was held in London in 1982. Uh, my memories of this are a little bit hazy now, but I do remember starting out as a member of the collective that planned the conference and leaving because of a political disagreement. I do remember what that disagreement was, but I don't think we've got any space to talk about that now. And now the conference was very much a reaction to the campaign by some lesbians in London to promote the politics of sadomasochism that they had adopted from the publications reaching the UK at that time from the Californian sadomasochist lesbian group, uh, Samoa. 
Now, radical and revolutionary feminists rejected sadomasochism, but there was a disagreement between radical and revolutionary feminists. I was a revolutionary feminist. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Georgia has said in the, in the chat, Jane Edgerton is now a heterosexual married woman. She was a lesbian at this time. Radical and revolutionary feminists rejected sadomasochism, but there was a disagreement over the importance of opposing it. Some of us were very committed to campaigning against it and for a sexuality of equality. We set up a group called Lesbians Against Sadomasochism and argued that the practice was a form of violence against lesbians and fundamentally linked to men's sexual violence in general and to pornography in particular. The middle years of the 80s in the women's liberation movement were characterized by what were called the sex wars and featured very acrimonious and serious disagreements about whether sex was something private and personal or totally tied into male domination and the oppression of women. The women who set up Trouble and Strife did not necessarily agree with us revolutionary feminists about sadomasochism. They may not have been in favor of the practice and Jane clearly was not in favor of the practice, but they seem to have thought that we saw it as more important than it was and it should not be a, such a prominent concern. And that was clear to me when I saw the front cover of this first issue of Trouble and Strife. There's a list of the contents and the piece on the sex conference is referenced by the phrase, sex, not the sadomasochism debate. And I remember being quite angry because I thought this was a, a crucial fight and that, that title was sort of putting down the significance of our fight. Um, it was a crucial fight because, of course, by the late 80s, the feminists challenged all the forms of male sexuality that eroticized women's subordination, particularly porn and sadomasochism was defeated. Sadomasochism, which had originally come from gay male practice to lesbians, began to shape everyday heterosexuality. And now, of course, strangulation has become quite an ordinary form of men's practice on women, particularly amongst the young. Sadomasochism was important then, I would suggest, and important now. So it was a bit annoying that some radical feminists wanted to play it down. Now, Jane explains her disagreement here in this quote. I nearly did not go to the conference because I anticipated it being dominated by the recent advice over whether said, well, sorry, recent debate over whether sadism and masochism should be acceptable sexual options for lesbians. I think this debate has now outlived its usefulness, especially considering that no vocal SM lobby has materialized in this country. In fact, of course, sadomasochism is now everywhere and dominating ordinary heterosexual practice. Although I find the SNM lobby pernicious and anti-feminist, I felt that the SNM obsession, so us revolutionary feminists were obsessed, might severely restrict the terms in which we talked about lesbian sex at the conference. So she wanted a more general um, discussion. Uh, can you take that one down, Joe? In fact, as uh, Jane explains, there was quite a broad discussion of sex and sexuality at the conference something that does not happen now. Lesbians at the conference engaged in quite profound discussions about what a lesbian was and how the development of lesbian feminism, in which many thousands of women chose to become lesbians, changed the understanding of lesbianism. Um, somebody's asking if Jane has come out as heterosexual. She's been very clearly heterosexual for a long, long time now. I don't know how many decades because I wasn't in this country. And uh, could we have the next slide, Joe? So uh, this is a, um, her comment on some of one of the discussions, and I think it's quite interesting at the conference. She says the, the, the basic disagreement was between women who felt that we often over-sexualized lesbianism in a way which was undermining to celibate lesbians and denies the extent to which the term lesbian now encompasses much more than the sexual dimension due to the development of lesbian feminism and other women who felt that the political definition of lesbianism sometimes desexualized our identities altogether and made them hinge on a political rejection of heterosexuality and feelings of sisterhood for other women. Now, this is just a tiny snapshot of the sort of conversations we had at the time. Now, I don't think the, the term celibate lesbian would exist because the, the idea of the lesbian has been narrowed down again to just a sort of minor sexual perversion. And you have to do the sex to be a lesbian. If you're not doing sex, you can't be a lesbian. And that's never meant 
it never meant the same for heterosexuality. Of course, heterosexuality is the whole culture. It has all of its ceremonies. It dominates everything in the culture in which we live. So heterosexuality has never been seen as just sexual encounters between men and women. And of course, people, women can be celibate heterosexuals. But the idea of a celibate lesbian would now be very difficult to imagine. But we used to have those discussions. There were whole books on what, what is lesbian friendship, what is lesbian feminism, and so on. Whereas now it is just seen as a sexual thing, probably as it is seen in men's pornography all over again. Um, okay, can you take that one down, Joe? Do you have any comments on it, Elizabeth? Just very briefly, I found it really interesting um, the that there was this conference. I wish I had been at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and just sort of the review of the different things that they talked about, the conflicts and intersections between um, the sort of definition of lesbians, the political significance of lesbianism, um, whether it's focused on sex and sexuality or whether it's something wider and more political. That was all very interesting to me. I did think it was sort of whatever the opposite of prophetic was that she sort of dismissed the importance of talking about S&M and how that was sort of invading lesbian culture and, and said that, you know, it was something, it was an issue that was no longer important and it wasn't going to be a problem and we didn't need to talk about it anymore. Um, so it was very sort of interesting and, and ironic to see someone say that at this point um, in view of what's happened since then, which is kind of exactly the opposite. Um, but it was very interesting to see what was discussed at this conference. And I think when we talk at the end about the interview um, with the feminist who came out as a lesbian in the 70s, there are a lot of um, similar themes that are raised. Um, so that's I think that's all I want to say for now. Thanks. Yeah, it's in, it's interesting that you respond in that way. And wouldn't it be marvelous to be able to talk about sexuality, lesbianism, all of these things now? But of course, we don't. And no, we haven't got a movement that can talk about anything of that kind. Um, OK, I'm going to go on to talk about the piece by Stevie Jackson called The Desire for Freud. Um, and Stevie Jackson is a sociologist. And in this piece, she criticizes the adoption by many feminists in the 1970s of Freudianism and the idea that Freud was important for feminist theory. Uh, could we have the first slide here, Joe? So, um, in the early days of the women's liberation movement, Freud's theories were rejected, but new readings of, of his work have gained many adherents amongst feminists today. So in the in the 40s and 50s and 60s, femi there were feminist books rejecting Freud as one of the first people, the most significant patriarchs that needed to be rejected for there to be feminism. But then there are new adherents. I want to show that the new brand of psychoanalysis has nothing to offer feminists. It's written in such difficult and complex language that the rest of us are barred from entering the debate. So if you could take that one down, Joe. The, the, um, the feminists who adopted Freud were not radical feminists, definitely not, or the revolutionary feminists. They were socialist feminists, such as Juliet Mitchell, Juliet Mitchell, who wrote Psychoanalysis and Feminism in 1975. We're told by these Freud enthusiasms, as C.V. Jackson says, that the new readings have purged the work of any sexism. The Freudians used the work of the French psychoanalyst, Lacan, which they used to say that males and females are constructed as sexed subjects through the acquisition of language. The penis becomes the phallus, which is seen as a symbol representative of the penis and nothing to do with Freud seeing the penis as superior. Stevie says that she doesn't think um, that um, she doesn't agree uh, with that. She does think that um, Freud does think the penis is superior. Um, and can we just have a, the next slide? 
This is Freud on penis envy, just a, just a little taster, um, he says, um, about girls. They notice the penis of a brother or playmate, strikingly visible and of large proportions, at once recognize it as the superior counterpart of their own small and inconspicuous organ, and from that time forward, fall a victim to envy for the penis. I mean, Freud is hilarious. I used to put all these um, quotes up on a board when I was teaching, and my students would roll about because it's so absolutely absurd. Uh, Freud said that, you know, um, women, would, because they had penis envy, might want professions, and they shouldn't want that. Absolutely not. They should want a baby. And when they got the baby, that made up for the penis envy, because especially if it was a boy, they got what he called the, um, the longed-for penis. But my very, very favourite quote from Freud is about how um, women in ancient history um, invented weaving and knitting because they needed to imitate pubic hair to cover up their loss of the penis, their castration, and the fact that they didn't have a penis. So that's why women knit. It's because they don't have a penis. I mean, it's just ridiculous, absurd stuff. But these socialist feminists um, really um, got, um, got into Freud and decided Freud was the answer. The reason, I think, is because um, they wanted to stick with their main understanding of the world being around class, economic class. Women didn't really fit with that. So if they were going to explain the oppression of women, they needed a completely different system, which was not structuralist, not materialist, not, signi not significant, really. And therefore, they said it was all to do with language happened in the first five years of life. If women were going to get rid of their oppression, they needed to be an analysis, which was very expensive for years and years and years and years. And that explained the oppression of women. I mean, horrendous. And of course, a radical and revolutionary feminists absolutely don't uh, believe um, that um, it's all in the mind. They understand the oppression of women to be absolutely material, absolutely structuralist, and for women to be a sex class. But if you want to explain the oppression of women, which clearly exists, you blame it all on women themselves, and it's in their head, and you do lots of very difficult to understand theory about how Freud was really right, wasn't anti-woman, and so on, in order to explain it. I think um, we need to um, move on. So Elizabeth, do you have any other comment on this? Can we take this one down, Joe? Thanks. I'm sorry we're running out of time because I could um, rant about Freud for several hours. Um, I, I found it, um, I always find it so interesting when feminists do sort of mental gymnastics to try to make Freudian theory somehow relevant to feminism um, or to women or feminist in itself, because I think that's so facially and patently absurd. Um, and so, I guess that that was sort of my main um, reaction to this. And I guess the one other thing I'll quickly say is that I think that trying to um, direct women to look inward and do psychoanalysis, Freudian psychoanalysis, is another deflection tool, very much like telling women that Marxism is what we need instead of feminism. Uh, you know, not that I don't think there's some... Um, useful um you know insights from marxism but when women are in marxist spaces and are told that the real problem isn't patriarchy the real problem is the class struggle and that if the class struggle is solved all women's problems will go away deflecting women to psychoanalysis strikes me as something very much analogous to that but the problem is you you have penis envy get on the couch and pay a psychoanalyst hundreds of dollars twice a week for 10 or 20 years and you'll probably solve your problem. Um, so to me, that's just a complete deflection and a way to get women to stop focusing on the real problem, which is that we're oppressed by patriarchy. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of my main reaction to this article and also to any attempts to sort of rebrand um, so psychoanalysis and Freudism, Freud Freudianism as somehow potentially feminist. <laughs> 
Okay. Are you going on to the next? Yes. So I believe this is the last one we're mm -hmm. going to be talking about. So the if you could have the slide um, about the interview when lesbians came out in the movement. Um, so in this interview, um, the interviewer from um, TNS talks with a feminist named Lynn Alderson about the first national lesbian conference, which occurred uh, in in the UK, which occurred in 1974 at Canterbury University, and what it was like to be a lesbian feminist in 1974. Um, and two of the things that really stood out for me was one, the power that the lesbian contingent at this conference sort of took for themselves, which I found really admirable. She describes um, what happened at this um, at this uh, National Lesbian Conference and says that aside from the question of relationships was the question of the nature of the lesbian presence in the women's movement. That was the other thing we talked about at great length. So, so they talked about two things at great length. One was what lesbian relationships consisted of, which kind of was an interesting thing to, to compare and contrast with um, Jane Edgerton's piece about uh, the other conference. Um, so lesbian relationships was one of the big topics that they talked about. And the other thing they talked about at great length, she says, was the question of the nature of the lesbian presence in the women's movement. It was in fact out of Canterbury that the decision to demand block workshops at the next National Women's Liberation Conference in Edinburgh came. We wrote the resolution and made sure it got to Edinburgh and insisted on it, and everyone spent the entire afternoon of the Edinburgh conference talking about lesbianism. So they were able to sort of make this an important enough topic that they were able to demand that the next National Women's Liberation Conference devote an entire afternoon to talking about the lesbian presence in the women's movement, um, what the role of lesbians were in the women's movement, um, what it should be, um, and so on. And I thought that was really interesting and very, um, very impressive that they were able to sort of take the the resolution to demand that an entire afternoon be devoted to this um, and that it actually happened. And then another thing that she um, talked about that I found really interesting in the interview was um, she says that at, at this time she was calling herself a separatist which meant I wanted nothing to do with men. I was far more concerned with the kinds of bonds women could make with each other. A lot of my separatism involved an enormous effort at unlearning everything that I had learned, which unfortunately was a great deal and all of it male culture. So it was really interesting to me that separatism was um, an important strand of lesbian feminism at the time that she came out um, in 1974. Um, and that it was something that was sort of discussed as a matter of course, as a strategy for feminists. Um, and, you know, now I think that that is a contentious issue when you, I, I have found that if I raise separatism in discussion, in feminist discussions, it's often sort of seen as something ridiculous, like, oh, are you just going to all go live on farms and never see men again? And um, it's talked about something that's almost ridiculous and, you know, could never happen and has no meaning. And if you try to sort of raise discussions about, well, what could separatism mean in women's lives? It doesn't necessarily have to mean living on a farm in the middle of nowhere, but there are many different approaches to separatism. And we should discuss what the, um, what the, um, advantages are of separatism and of being women focused, focusing your lives around women and around feminism rather than focusing your lives around men, and that this could be possible even for women who are heterosexual. When you try to bring up discussions like that, um, very often they're just not treated with seriousness. So it was really interesting to me to see um, that this was something that was very importantly being discussed at the time. Um, Sheila, I'm going to give you a chance to uh, respond for a second because I want to sort of scroll through the article and see what else I want to bring up about it. Okay. Um, 
Yes, I think one of the things that I found fascinating about the article is that Sheila Shulman <clears throat> talked about how in 1974, she saw a gay man dressed in drag at a sort of mixed conference where actually the lesbians separated off because they didn't actually want to be anywhere near the gay men. And she was furious. And the word she uses about this gay man in drag in 1974 was that it was balderdash, total misogyny, and a parody of a woman. So incredibly clear, and this was 50 years ago. And that is what feminists and lesbian feminists thought at that time. There was no messing about. Whereas now, of course, gay men's drag dominates the television. Um, it's absolutely everywhere. Everything has to have drag in it and drag uh, uh, with that terrible woman hating, which is still, of course, what it's about is very dominant in culture. So we've lost an enormous, enormous amount. And it was the, the wonderful movement we had then and the politics were so wonderfully clear. Um, and about the block workshops, I remember the block workshops. I was at the Edinburgh conference. I was not a lesbian at that time. It took me three more years to become a lesbian. But I was at the block workshops at that conference, and I was fascinated. Block workshops on lesbianism I was absolutely gripped. So that was probably an important part of my being able um, to become a lesbian and know that I should become a lesbian. That was really, really important. And as you say, there were all those discussions at the time, again, about lesbian relationships and what lesbian feminism was. We had a lesbian feminist movement, not a separate movement, but nonetheless, a movement going on that was huge and powerful. It, not so powerful in 74, but within a few years, it was. And now um, lesbians are really sort of battened down, barely able to use the word and so on. So we have got a lot that we need to reinvent. I should say, and it's quite an interesting point though, in terms of what we've been talking about, the two of the pieces that I talked about, uh, which is the um, Ruth Walsgrove piece on uh, Green and Common and the Jane Edgerton piece on the Sex and Sexual Practice Conference, both of those women, as I understood it, as I understand it, did what we called at the time, going back to men. So it, it, I think it is worth mentioning that um, in this discussion. But yes, um, and also I should say that I became a separatist. I wasn't a separatist at that time, but I'm still a separatist. I'm happy to say that I am. I don't have, um, I don't give my emotional and most precious energies to men, although I've always been involved in teaching men and boys and, and so on. But I'm, I'm more what Janice Raymond calls an insider, outsider. I've always been in the workplace and in the world, but I have a separatist emotional life with women and cultural life with women as well. Okay, over to you, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I think you bring up exactly what I was talking about, about what separatism means and why we can't seem to have discussions about it. And when you bring up separatism, um, it's immediately sort of reduced to this idea that we're all gonna go live on farms in the middle of nowhere. Whereas you just described a completely different experience of separatism, which I think obviously very realistic. Um, and I wish that we could have these discussions without the topic being uh, dismissed. Another thing I wanted to point out is uh, toward the end of the interview, um, she talks about how there was sort of this br brief honeymoon period, it seems, where um, lesbians were able to um, bring up the place of lesbians in the movement and demand conference have um, an entire afternoon devoted to talking about it. But then it seems like that there started to be pushback against that almost immediately. Um, she, she says, I remember a long discussion with one of the heterosexual then celibate women in my writer's group who had been saying for some time that she felt oppressed um, by the lesbians in the group of whom there were two at that point out of seven. So it seems that sort of almost as soon as lesbians were able to bring up their experience and their um, ideas about feminism, just the fact of talking about being a lesbian made some heterosexual women feel oppressed. Um, and she, she said, she then asked the woman, um, she said, the group had enabled me to become clearer and clearer about being a lesbian. 
was that clarity the source of why this other woman felt oppressed? And the other woman said, yes, it was a challenge to her. The fact that um, lesbians were talking about being lesbian was a challenge to this heterosexual woman. It threatened her, not that I was doing the threatening, but she fully recognized that the simple fact of my becoming clearer as a lesbian was inherently somehow a threat to her. Um, and then the interviewer says, is that because it means that you have to question sexuality as a whole? She says, yes, very intimately in her mind, generally and abstractly. So the fact that lesbians by existing were sort of bringing up um, the idea that women should question the nature of their heterosexuality in a patriarchal system was very threatening and oppressive to um, some heterosexual women. So that was very interesting. And I think, unfortunately, that's something that still exists today. Yeah, is that so that's about all I have to say? I know we're that's... running out of time and I'll turn it back over to you, Sheila. We are running out of time. Um, I, I hope everybody realizes we had an enormous amount of content here and we only did six of the articles that were in this first issue. Um, and then there's loads more issues right up until 2002. There's lots of fascinating pieces in there. And what they show is that there was a women's liberation movement which was full of ideas and contention and disagreements and lots and lots and lots of writing by a wide, wide spread of women, whereas now it seems to be a few women writing books and maybe some academics and so on. We didn't really have feminist academics much at the time, so... We couldn't be taken over in that way. Um, but yes, it was it was an extraordinary time in that way. And I want us to have it again. I want women to be able to, in long form, write about what they are thinking, develop ideas, disagree with what somebody said before, say something else. And that's how we developed ideas. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible now to imagine that because all that really happens is there's activism. We're always in crisis. We have to fight this. We have to fight that. And we do. But to be able to have that, um, that thinking again would be amazing. And somebody did say, um, I think, in the chat that the problem now is, of course, we have the climate crisis. Um, we have the nuclear weapons, but, you know, that was dealt with in the 1980s. But now... And it strikes me we've been ha we've had about 50 years of women being able to get into the professions, have decent jobs, make some kind of impact at all in the world, and now it's climate crisis. We only had 50 years. That's not very long in the thousands of years of human history to have 50 years. It just seems so incredibly unfair that now we're in this extraordinary crisis. But I still think we need to go back and look at some more of the wonderful pieces in that journal in the little while ahead. What do you think, Elizabeth? Last thoughts? I agree. It seems like we're always in a crisis. And some, in some ways, I feel like the crises are, again, distractions from women being able to focus on our oppression and how to end it. Um, there's going to be another crisis, but I, I agree with you. I think as long as we, as long as humans to stay on earth and not be destroyed by one thing or another. Um, we need to be able to focus our attention on um, our own political liberation and not be distracted by and deflected into other things. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. It's been a delight to talk with you. Thank um, you as always. Yeah. Um, and I that that's it, folks. Um, we will leave you now. Lovely to talk with you all. Bye for now.